John Henry Clark, Thomas Hunter Professor Emeritus from the Department of Black and Political Studies, uh, a preeminent scholar within uh, dealing with African societies and Afro, 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 African and Afro-American culture and history. Uh, without any further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce you to Professor Clark, his topic, Spiritual and Human Values in African Societies Before the First European Contact. Thank you very much. Um, I will begin by acknowledging the fact that we live in a European conceived intellectual universe. And anyone who attacks a subject of this nature goes against that fact. And this is an ingrained fact, the fact of living in a European conceived intellectual universe. And this concept of a European conceived intellectual universe became very firm in the 15th and the 16th century. And it deals with a principal decision that Europeans made during the 200 year turning point in their history when they came out of the Middle Ages and made a decision on world dominance. They remembered the almost 1,000 years of Islamic and Arab domination of the Mediterranean and Spain starting with the rise of Islam after the fall of the Roman Empire, and they were blocked from free entry into the Mediterranean. And Europe had to literally feed on itself. And so they had a one-dimensional intellectual diet, a one-dimensional cultural diet. They were people whose resources had to come mainly from Europe. And when Europe has only Europe to turn to, Europe is poor indeed. But each time Europe builds an, inter an empire, Europe has the ability, the gall, and the nerve, and the muscle to reach beyond Europe and to take things that does not belong to Europe. Now, in the period after the Crusades, Europe found itself still people poor, resource poor, and land poor. It had survived the Crusades. It had survived the famines and the plagues. It was getting itself together. But they were still blocked from the free use of the Mediterranean by the Africans, the Arabs, and the Berbers still controlling Spain and still in controlling control the sea lanes of the Mediterranean. Now, they would hold this position, meaning the Africans, the Arabs, and, this, and the Berbers, they would still hold this position solidly for another 50, 50 years. But arguments between the Africans, puritanical Africans, and backsliding Arabs, because Islamic denominations are becoming corrupt, two military groups then controlling the Mediterranean and Spain after Portugal had gotten under, from under the yoke 
the Almoravis and the Almohades had permitted Portugal to free herself from the domination. But this weakness brought on by internal strife by Europe's enemies, the declared infidels, had weakened their hold on the Mediterranean to the extent that Portugal attacked, attacked a part of Africa, 1550, a little plot enclave in Morocco called Sutra. It's about the size of Central Park, a small number, but that's not significant. The significant thing is that for the first time, almost a thousand years, Europeans had drawn the blood of Africans, and they had invaded the territory of a hated infidel. Now the Europeans called the Muslims infidels, and the Muslims called the Europeans infidels. All right, now, this is a condition, the condition of calling people infidels is a condition of the creation of people outside of Europe. The, Ar the Africans never refer to people not of his religion as being an infidel because he did not belong to his religion, not of the Africans' creation. But now, 1450, with the Castilians asserting themselves, 1455, with the Pope telling the Span Spain and Portugal, you are both authorized to reduce to servitude all infidel people Literally, you need not feel guilty for what you do in the slave trade. 1455. Now you have two trends in history. One that history has forgotten. At the same time, this drama is unfolding in the Iberian Peninsula. There are great independent states inside Africa, inside Western Africa, the Western Sudan. The state of Sangue is in great shape. And it's about to get one of its two greatest rulers, two of the greatest rulers Africa would know in the last 2,000 years. Sony Ali is about to come to power. He's going to be followed by Muhammad Ibtumi, known in history as Askia the Great. So all Africa didn't fall at one time in there would be independent states of great magnitude 200 years into the slave trade period. But now, 1482, an expedition sailed down the coast of Africa and demanded the right to build permanent fortification. And they built castle called El Mina, or the mine. In this expedition was a little known sailor, Cristo Colon, later known as Christopher Columbus. And he said in his diary, as man and boy, I sailed up and down the Guinea coast for 23 years. What was he doing up and down the coast of West Africa for 23 years? He was obviously in the early Portuguese slave trade. Another lecture, another time. But once we examine Christopher Columbus, he's, he will stop being the Western hero that a whole lot of people think he is. All right, that's not significant for now, except that he encountered African sailors who had already gone to the New World. And they told him a few things that helped him when he finally went. The important thing is that Europeans made a decision once they got together. And that is, whosoever ruled the world is going to be one of them. They had lost sentimental attachment to themselves they had lost sentimental attachment to the world. And they had the cooperation of the church in sanctioning 
what they did. And the church assigned the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Genoa to look after the church's interest in the trade. So now, with the Europeans out to colonize most of the world, they began to colonize information about the world. This is the beginning of the concept of a European conceived intellectual universe. From the 15th and the 16th century on, the way we look at the world, the way we look at people, the way we look at history, the way we look at the Bible, the way we look at God would be through concepts laid down by Europe. The concept of everything good being white and black being evil and Asian being diabolical Fu Manchuism is now about to start and they are now going to set in motion an image that's going to come down to the present day. It's going to reflect in textbooks, going to reflect in movies, going to reflect in cartoons, going to reflect in ma the mass media to such an extent that the victims are going to believe it. It is going to be whitewashed, brownwashed, blackwashed to such an extent that it's going to take over the mentality of the world. They're not only going to convince themselves that it's so, they're going to convince those who suffer from it that it is so. And this is how it all started. Now, let us look at that world before thousands of years before this happened, before there was any European at all, before the word Europe was used, it is hard for you to conceive, but there was a time when there was no Europe at all, when there was no state at all, when the Greeks had no name, when England had no name, there was no England, there was no Roman state or no Rome, when there was no Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. There was a time in the world there was no Moses, there was no Adam and Eve. And none of these things had existed. And the mythology out of which these things came hadn't been exposed to the people who copied them from others and made them part of the myth and the literature of the world. There was a time when this had not happened. Now let's see if we can look back and see what happened during that time because it seems inconceivable to most people that right and wrong was figured out before the European came to tell people that something was right and something was wrong. And nations lived thousands of years before, lived in some time in war, some time in peace, but mostly in peace, didn't know that a European existed. And those nations that became European nations were those nations closest to Africa in Western Asia, Rome and Greece. All right, take into consideration because this is a fact. 
Ethiopia and Egypt is mentioned 80 times in the Bible. England is not mentioned once. Poland is not mentioned once. Germany is not mentioned once. Russia is not mentioned once. No nation in the Scandinavian countries mentioned once because these nations did not exist at the time. All right. If every Scan any Scandinavian schoolboy or any person of European descent, any place in the world, can claim Greece as his intellectual, his or her intellectual heritage. And when his or her country did not exist at the time of Greece, and yet Africans are questioned when they claim Egypt as their intellectual heritage, and their respective countries did not only exist, but some of the original population that settled in Egypt came from their respective countries. Now, the relationship of the Romans and the Greeks, especially the Greeks, the relationship that they had was with the people across the Mediterranean and not with the people of what became Europe because what became Europe wasn't functional at the time. Now, I can make a better case for Greece being a part of Africa than you can make for Egypt being a part of any place except Africa. Because physically, Egypt cannot be found any place except in Africa. And Egypt never had any consequential relationship with anybody in its early development except within Africa itself. And what we need to deal with is the Nile Valley, which stretches 4,000 miles inside of Africa. And we need to deal with the migration down that river, and we need to read the early literature of the Egyptians themselves. We also need to remember that the ancient Egyptians never called that country Egypt. Thousands of years before the Greeks slapped the name Egypt on the country, in their own literature, the Papyrus of Hunafa, they said, we came from the mountains of the moon at the headwaters of the Nile, where the great God happy dwell. The God happy is still one of the ancient African gods sometimes worshipped to this very day. Mountain worship is still prevalent in some parts of Africa. Because this is where the God happy is supposed to dwell, like among the God people that I have lived among. That God lives in a lagoon. So if they want to pay, pray to the ancient gods, they go by a lagoon with fresh water. All right, now, if you understand the migration down the river and the fact that the lower upper Nile means Ethiopia, Uganda, and, and the like, Lower Nile means where Egypt is today, and that the river is a contradiction, and that it was an ancient highway, a great cultural highway, bringing people in and out, and that throughout its history, the great fortunate circumstance of the people who became Egypt is that this constant flow of people kept renewing its energy, and that the nation state of Egypt was a culmination of several civilizations, from the Tigris and the Euphrates, 
because no one would have created a civilization as great as this without having a replica at home. Then you would have a model at home. You would not create a civilization this great some other place without first creating one at home. And the Europeans would not have come from under all of that ice to go all the way over to Africa and create a great stone civilization, then go back into Europe and live 2,000 years in barbarism before they make a good European shoe or live in a house that had a window. So now, when you put logic to the situation, the whole idea of Europe having anything to do with it becomes utterly ridiculous and becomes even beyond laughter. All right, now, let us look at this early river civilization, because nearly all civilizations were river civilizations, and look at the social thought of this river civilization, then before we go to the other river civilizations. All right, now, I am not saying that this was the only great river civilization. I'm saying that this was the first of the great civiliza river civilizations of the world. I am not downgrading the great river civilization of the Tigris and the Euphrates. I'm saying that this might have been the second of the great river civilization, the Tigris and the Euphrates. I'm not downgrading the river civilization of the Ganges or any river civilization. I'm saying that in chronological sequence, this one might have been the longest, this was positively the longest in its life and contributed the most to the other civilizations of the world. All right, now when you look at South East Africa, North East Africa, present day research, obviously, <laughs> the research indicates that the concept of early man started in this area. The concept of organized societies started in this area. Now, if organized societies started in this area, there must have been a crowding or difference of opinion it caused people to move down this river, down this culture highway, to ultimately settle at the lower end. But there were people settling all along. Now, if you read Chancellor Williams' book, The Destruction of Black Civilization, the second chapter, Egypt, Ethiopia's oldest daughter, one of the better chapters written on the subject, or John Jackson's introduction to African civilization, and read his chapter, Ethiopia and the Evolution of Civilization. There is a wealth of material on the Southern African origins of, of the people called Egyptian. Now, in order to get across the illusion of the out and out lie that Africans were not the creators of Egypt, white scholars, if they can be called scholars, had to ignore white scholars who have done masterful work in the field that you never see them quote or refer to at all. Gerald Massey's masterwork, Egypt, Light of the World, two volume, Natural Genesis, two volume, Book of the Beginning, two volume. Massey devoted 40 years of his life to this single book. And he spun a generation of new scholars, especially in England, 
Alvin Church Ward, whose book Signs and Symbols of Primordial Men is still a classic work. And in the United States, a, a, a fine scholar, still being ignored by American scholars, Alvin Boyd Hume, whose excellent work, Who is This King of Glory, may be one of the clearest works ever written on the Christ story. And his second great work, um, Shadow of the Third Century, dealing with misconceptions of Christianity, but also dealing with the African intellectual father of the church, St. Augustine, and St. Augustine's opinion of the council meetings at Nasi, who said that it makes him laugh. Because he said, these people are arguing about a religion we had all along. St. Augustine is clear about the fact that there was nothing new about Christianity. We had the, the Africans had the same religion on another name long before Christ. But Boy Kuhn is not read, and in three new books by after he died, Canons of Faith and others. Health Science Group in, 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 in uh, California has published three of his books in posthumous today. But they, they don't read it. But uh, other than that, the other works written and published by Europeans among German writers writing on the same subject, still ignored. The early German writer, A.M.E. Hirin, the six-volume work listed at Hirin's Research, his fourth volume, this is written a history of the e economic history of the ancient world. His fourth volume, a history of the commercial trade intercourse between the Egyptians, Ethiopians, and Excellent work. And uh, you, if you could find it, if you could find the six volumes in a rare book store, if you get them for five hundred dollars, you're getting them. You get them in a box. I bought the five, the six for seventy-five dollars because the. The book dealers, Sam Wisner, just happened to be in town, and I've sent so many customers over the years. He just let me have it for seventy-five. It's rare that you would even find them for sale. Well, somebody died, and somebody closed out an estate, and the, and the people who own this estate don't care too much for books anyway. So they, you know, they, that's about the only way you get a copy. You know. It has not been republished. It's not only deals with Africa, deals with Western Asia, deals with early ancient Europe. The Heron's research, that's H E R R E N. This is the early German writer. The second German writer that that's ignored by the Western academic community is Heinrich Bach. Bach went out with the um, British expedition in the 1880, in 1850s, 30s, of, yeah, yeah, because his work, his work appeared in the 1850s. And Blumenblatt, alleged father of anth sociology, anthropology, one of them. Well, the British had a poor expedition. They didn't have much money. They wanted one man to do three jobs. So he sent this brilliant student who could read all kind of languages and you know all kind of skills. He was a botanist and then he was a good draftsman. And Bach was so thorough. Each time he come to a place, he would draw the plant life, the animal life, you know, the rose. I mean, what kind of, the river, which way it's flowing, dress. He, he was thorough and. He, he could read Arabic and translate it and 
digest history of the Tourettes, to the histories of the different kingdoms. And some of the English, most of them died, but Bob lived, he was healthy as he could be when he, uh, when he came back. And the British had promised to publish his, his findings. And by the time he got back, the British group that promised to publish was no longer in power. They politically had lost. But they had promised to publish his findings, so they published it in a limited edition called the Temple Edition. That's five volumes. And that edition went out, but it was published again in a three-volume work. I, I do not own a, a Temple Edition, and very few libraries own an edition. I've only seen three, three volumes of the Temple Edition, and I failed to buy them because I didn't see the other two, and it was a great mistake. So they I, were, were in the midst of a um, historical cover up this was going over for several hundred, at least a couple. It was 500 years. 500 years. Uh, Van Sediment called it the 500 year rule. That our history has been locked into a 500 year rule. But Heinrich Bach went through inner West Africa, the kingdom, and he wrote a digest history of these kingdoms as an appendix for I think it's volume two of the three volumes. Been roaming around in an old bookstore in Peekskill. I picked up all three for ten dollars. Cost me fifty dollars to have them bound. An old socialist running a bookstore there who liked people and especially if they were interested in books and wanted to sit and talk with him and you know. He wasn't trying to make any money, he just seemed to be more interested in a good conversation. So I, I got the books cheap, you know, had them bound, bought some other things. So I got, in addition for me, I got a Cast Limited in England, published another edition, which cost me about $72, because I didn't know the difference between guineas and shillings and, you know. So they said, there's so many guineas, so I thought that was cheap, and I said, oh, send it to me. And they've got the bill. <laughs> what, what is it that you characterize it? You know, uh, Pastor, would you allow Professor Clark to speak and then after oh. and then he can take any questions? Oh, okay. oh, no, um, let, let's, let's, I, I just want to deal with the literature briefly, then we're going to go, right? we're going to finish. Now, Frobenius is the, is the last of the German writers that's neglected. He, um, he lived into the German colonial period, and he wrote a massive five-volume history of Africa, African civilization, never been completely translated, but condensed into a large two-volume work called The Voice of Africa. But there have been a lot of excerpts from Frobenius's work. But Lady Flora Shaw Lugard, who went out to Nigeria to write a series of articles defending the British takeover of Liberia, Nigeria, and fell in love with the British governor and married him. So now she's a top lady. She don't supposed to work. She still want to finish her book, and so she spoke some languages and. And she wanted to write a preface on what happened in this part of Africa before the Europeans came. And doing research for a preface, she found so much interesting information on what happened. The research for the preface became the book. And the book is called A Tropical Dependency. The book became literally a Bible for anti-colonialist Africans, including Nkrumah, Many of our early scholars, Hansberry, was converted to 
being an African scholar by virtue of reading this book. Now, I digress merely to let you know that there is a large body of work written by whites, and these, this work is ably written, and that some of them devoted a lifetime, an entire life, to setting straight African history and social thought. And they're still being ignored, rather ever quoted. Now I can go on mentioning work written by, by Africans, but these men rendered good service in showing that Africans played a commendable part in the history of the world. Joe Massey proved that what you think are European religions are nothing but the rehash of African religions. And he shows in diagram how these religions were systematically taken from Africa. And he takes the major Western religions. Now, an African writer, Ben Yakinen, has done a more succinct job in his work, The African Origins of Major Western, Western Religions. But I'm merely pointing to white writers that white scholars refuse to read. Now, I've neglected a major one, that is Sir, Sir Godfrey Higgins' two-volume work, Anacalypsis, dealing with the dispersion of African people throughout the world, including the dispersion of African people through Asia, in the presence of African-looking emperors on the throne of China, and the fact that when the Romans arrived in England, they found African people. And the interesting thing, which we haven't been able to deal with to this day, that everywhere they found African people in the world, there had been no war between the African people and the other people that they had met, proving that African people can merge and meet other people without necessarily having a cultural conflict or a physical conflict, which might again explain the presence of African people in the New World where the so-called Indians elevated them to war laws and and deities without having any conflict with them. All right, now, I want to go back to a period after the formation of the villages and the city societies with the beginning of the unification of people coming down the Nile and the development of social thought and the first beginning of the formation of humane and social thought. Now, I'm talking about a period now before any of the world religions. And I'm not talking about religion at all, because I am talking about spirituality. Because the Africans at first did not approach this from a point of view of religion, but believed that there was a universal spirituality presiding over the world. And this period of believing, believing in a universal spirituality is, in my opinion, man's highest order. And that formal religion and denomination literally toned down man's spirituality and made it to the point today where he, he is in shambles. But during this early period of Nile Valley civilization, when he believed in a universal spirituality and he lived at peace with everything around him, 
The Africans believe that everything had a soul. Now trouble would begin when foreigners would copy African religions and would take an arrogant attitude toward himself and the concept of soul. When man said that he alone has a soul and the dog and the cockroach has no soul, that is when man began to lose his soul. When the Africans they say that everything has a soul, including the dog and the cockroach and the snake and the tree, and he didn't cut down a tree without a ceremony because he was cutting down a living thing, I believe that this was man's highest spiritual hour on this earth. And this was a period of social thought and humane thinking that the world might have to try to at least think about if not go back to. Because this was the period when the Africans projected certain concepts that the world thinks it wants to go back to that it is morally incapable of to this day. This was the period of the matrilineal Man did not argue about whether woman had equality, never used the word equality. He just assumed that no one would be so stupid as to argue about whether he's equal to his mother because a woman was the giver of life. And you going to argue that she is not equal to you? You go, <laughs> you, can you dare, would you dare argue this point? Can you have a baby? <laughs> so the African began to not make a special place for her because she was physically weak or anything like that but make special concessions built into the society itself. And he was secure enough not to fear her overdoing or overusing these concessions. So at this point, most of the societies were matrilineal. The lineage coming down to the female side of the family. And the woman, having certain basic considerations built into the society itself, and certain basic rights built into the society itself. Now this will explain, at least in part, why the African woman, the first woman to head the state, head a state, the first woman to ride at the head of her army, and the first woman to call court and to preside over the court. And these societies existed for a long time that existed without the interference of any foreigners at all. It is hard for people to conceive and sometimes hard for the African to conceive because his mind is so warped by foreign rule and foreign propaganda. But most of his existence has been a time when he was self-sustaining, self-governing, master of his own destiny. Most of the total time he's been on the earth. Now, because land was plentiful, water was plentiful, and women were plentiful, he had no argument. Now, this seems rather simplistic, but any time a society is short of land, water, or women, the society is in trouble. Because one of those shortages can hamper an entire society. 
Because without women, you can't reproduce yourself. Without water, you can't sustain yourself. Without land, you can't feed yourself. We had no shortage of either one. So this was a period before the I love you marriage. It spoiled everything. See, here's, here's where marriage was for the sake of union of people, union of group, and sometimes union of cattlehood. Might offend some people today, but sometimes we brought all those sheep and goats and together, and two people came together, and they benefited by it too. Then it kept down walls, kept down dissension. And it united one group, sometime who filled another group. These consolidations. And this was part of the network that made the village and subsequently the state. And all of this started and before people start calling something Religion. He got in trouble once he put a name on it. Once he put a name on it, it became difficult. But once, while he was accepting it as a universal force, force of the universe, presiding over everybody, it was simplistic. And there was no argument about it. Now, <coughs> Formal intelligence, formal learning is going to take a leap forward, a formal leap forward. This is going to be the third dynasty, about 2800 BC. A commoner, M. Hotel, became advisor to King Zuza. And this commoner, one of the most brilliant men of his day or any day, built the step pyramid. He was the world's first physician. And the Greek who's called the world's first physician says in his own writing, I am a child of M. Hotel. He lived 2,000 years before the Greek, who's called the world's first physician. He began to bring intellects together to discuss mysteries of life, mysteries of death, mysteries of falling things. And out of these intellectual discussions came the embryo of secret intellectual societies, the basis of what is going to later be a lodge for the South at Aswan, the great lodge at Luxor. This would be the beginning of the first semblance of the university in the whole world. This would be the training ground for a lot of the writing, for the book that is called the Book of the Coming Forth by the Day and the Night, that the Europeans call the Book of the Dead. This would be the gathering place for the scholars of the Nile Valley. This would be the training ground for the Palpacus, the different texts. Now the book, what you think of the Book of the Dead is really an anthology, a gathering of the large numbers of these books, some of the better ones, gathered under one text. The Papas of Hunafa is part of this, this collection, and there's another. Uh, there's a number of texts within this, within this single text. And a lot of the writing in this text 
went into the writing of the Bible, another anthology. Now, this is the third dynasty. Between the third and the sixth dynasty, not only you have a development of social thought, but you have the great building age, pyramids, great temples are being built. You have the development of several types of religion, but you have something else we have not paid much attention to. You have the development of the concept of the law of opposite. If you got a god, you got to have a goddess. Something Western man has never balanced. So you have two great female gods. There were many. The best known, Hathor, whose influence was spread to India, the basis of the whole sacred cow worship in India today. Maya. Two best known of the female gods of the ancient world. Now, it was really around my yacht that we got that that we get the, the, the so-called what the Westerners call the negative confessions from which Moses extracted the Ten Commandments. Now, Africa's one of Africa's greatest contributions to social thought and humanistic thinking is really this proclamation of Maya, which they mistakenly call the negative confession. Now, if you read, the, read what you call the negative confession, there's nothing negative about any of it. People name things without thinking about what they are naming. Now, simply, at the great lodge at Luxor, the students who are going to become oracles, great master teachers, who show pretension, enter at seven, seven years old. They stay 40 years. Then they are examined to see if they could continue to be master teacher. Then you get your examination, see if you're going to continue. That's apprenticeship. You continue until you're 70, then you become a master teacher and you go out in the public and give freely of your talent the rest of your life. But you stand before your masters, your teachers, and you recite these 42 confessions, they're not negative at all. I have not been guilty of violating my neighbor's wife. I have not been guilty of stealing, you know, my dozen so. I have not been done this. There's nothing negative about what you're saying. These are purification rites. I have not, if you have not been guilty of any of these things, and if your teachers are satisfied that you have not been guilty of any of them, then you're qualified to continue on to school until you're 70, then you turn out as a master teacher. Now these, these writings were in existence over 2,000 years before Moses was born. Now we have to deal with one of the great myths in Nile Valley civilization. The cause of the Hebrew entry, what they learned, and what they misunderstood, and what they still misunderstand to this very day. And the misinterpretation of Moses to this very day. Of who was Moses? which I will not fight out here. But they came in the 1700s BC. Escaping the difficulties of Western Asia, mostly famine. 
All right, Africa owes them nothing, so, and yet Africa was kind. Africa gave shelter. Africa gave position. Africans did not chase them away. They got good humane treatment in Africa. Africans have always been hospitable to strangers. This has been Africa's trap. It was a trap in the slave trade. Nobody ever had to fight their way into Africa. And they stayed and they, they, they lived in some kind of decency. 1680, that was an invasion in Western Asia by a group of rulers referred to as the Shepherd Kings, Hitzar. They knew the people who invaded. They, they had lived in the same basic area. They spoke the language. They became servants and collaborators with the invaders as against the African who had befriended them. We're not talking Bible now, we're talking facts, historical facts. All right. Here, with Africans, emerged among them maybe the world's first real dealer politician, Joseph, called the provider, who had the ear of the foreign king. He emerged an acquisition in history was never proven. What I ought to prove that they were slaves in Egypt. No scholar, Jewish or otherwise, ever proved. Just repeated, but nobody ever proved one word of it. Nobody ever proved they made bricks with or without law. Straw. No one ever proved they built any pyramids because all the pyramids were built before they got arrived. The space was built before, before they arrived. That's not important. What is important is that these Western Asian strangers came into Africa's house and got humane treatment. That's the only significant point. and that they saw a house that was culturally rich, religiously rich. And they came in without a clear language, a clear religion, and a clear vision of themselves. And they left basically with all three, large in number, led by an African, the important thing is the cultural aspect and that all of them did not leave in the so-called exodus and that was a 16 mile land bridge connecting Africa with Western Asia so therefore they walked in there was nothing to prevent them from walking out Charleston Heston did not lead them out. <laughs> Cecil B. DeMille's had nothing to do with it. It's just an interesting story. But now, this is basically what happened. You got to find the king who knew not Joseph. The indigenous kings came to power. owed no political favor to Joseph or his people and said, whosoever are willing to live under indigenous African rule, obey indigenous African law may stay. Anybody not willing to do this will have to go. It's as simple as that. Those who decided they weren't going to live under African rule went the rest who decided stayed. 
and a large Jewish population. Some of them were there when the Romans arrived. Now, the simple true story is rather unromantic, but it is the simple true story. Whether they left 600 in number, I tend to, to question. 600,000. And I also tend to question whether a forest could support that many people for that particular time. A forest of this time, or a forest of that time, or any time. Now, after this, you've got a period of recovery, 17th and the 18th dynasty. Then we go to the main figure of social thought in that in the 18th dynasty is Akhenaten. <coughs> Although I would love to discuss Hatshepsu because I, I I'm very intrigued with women in power, but I don't have the time for that. Because Akhenaten is so misunderstood. Akhenaten, who did not want to come to power around 1380 or thereabout, son of Queen Tai, a Nubian woman from the south, and in Hotel the Third, would rather write poetry and play with his cousin Nefertiti. But he did come to power. He outlawed warfare. He thought so much of life he wouldn't crush a flower. He permitted the nation, colonists of Egypt, to break away and gain their independence. And he was a man of great peace. Some people call him father of monotheism. Some people say Jews created monotheism. Now let's correct this because neither Akhenaten or the Jews created monotheism. Akhenaten dealt with the corrupt ministry of that day who assigned to themselves so much power, they were literally hustling on the people, telling the people that they had so much authority that they couldn't go from different places because they, their power extended only so far. He merely got across the universality of the spiritual force and that that force our God was everywhere. So neither Akhenaten or the Hebrews created monotheism because monotheism was there all along because all the Africans had to do, and this is what Akhenaten did, Akhenaten merely taught them to recognize what they had all along. The concept of the universality of the spiritual force. What you call it, God, what, no matter what you call it, it was there all along and there for you. And no matter where you went in the universe, that spiritual force was there to go with you. That's all he did. To announce it as one thing, to create it as another. Neither one created it. Now, the Hebrews wrote about it because it came during the time. But Moses, who had some difficulty in the Pharaoh's house, when he met, went among them, he made a deal, obey my God, I'll be your leader. And his God was taken from what he had learned about the teachings of Akhenaten. It's as simple as that. Now, 
we're coming to the end of the great spirituality of Egypt because after the 18, we find the dynasty of the Ramesses, the 19, giving Egypt its last great strength, the weakness setting in after the 19, then the Kushites from the south moves up and show their cousins how to rule a state one more time. Now to strengthen Egypt, they will send three generals to the north, Castor, Pianchi, Tahaka, starting in 751 BC. Now this is the last of Egypt's true greatness. There will be seven more dynasties. These were the dynasties of mixed breeds, mixed Assyrians, mixed Iranians, mixed Greeks, mixed Romans. But the 25th was Egypt's last walk in the sun. Now you can say it ended, but remember, it ended after four or five thousand years, and it lasted maybe 10 times longer than anybody else's day in the sun. This was a civilization that had the strength, the holding strength, to do more and to last longer and to give and to leave a much better account of itself than any other civilization in the history of the world and to leave behind concepts of humane value and social thought that would influence the world and that are still influencing the whole world. Now, I'm going to conclude by talking all too briefly about the civilization of the other rivers, principally the Niger, the Volta, Limpopo, and the Congo. Because I'm skipping a mass, a vast area. I'm skipping over the role of Africans in the development of Christianity, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But after the Roman X and the Africans and the Arabs established themselves in Spain and the Mediterranean, the formation of states in inner West Africa, called the Western Sudan, began to have social thought and humane treatment for its people, similar to and sometimes equal to that of Egypt. And remember, some of the population of Egypt, a great deal of the population, after the invasion of Egypt by Cambyses from Iran, what is now Iran, 550 BC, the population began to scatter. So the original population of Egypt began to leave Egypt. And by the time Alexander, the Macedonian, arrived, at least one half of the original population was gone. Until today, <clears throat> you may not find a single descendant of the original Egyptian in Egypt, but you might find many of them in Africa, but not in Egypt. You find them in the Sudan, you find them in Ethiopia, you find them in large places in Africa, but they physically left Egypt. Those many, it was, a, it was a tremendous tragic impact of the Roman destruction of Carthage. A whole lot of people left North Africa. The reverberation of that tragedy caused a whole lot of people just to move from that whole junk area. 
I mean, migrations and movements within Africa hasn't been uh, properly assessed. All right, but now, Ghana, this is one of the best known of the states, became a great state, a great humane state, under several remarkable kings, Tennessee, and the last of its great ones was Tenkemeni, known as the king who rode out twice a day, every day. This state was literally destroyed by the Muslims, 1076, giving away to the second state, Mali. And this state rose to height under the King Mansa Musa, 1332, 13, no, 1306 to 1332. Um, this state ultimately was absorbed into Sangay, it absorbed what was Ghana and what was Mali. The Sangian state lived 200 years into the slave trade period. Noted for its humane tax laws. When the British uh, was delayed in entering the slave trade, entered, they drove the Portuguese out of West Africa and the Portuguese went to the Congo formed a partnership with the African, and the African grew sick of the partnership, and the Portuguese tried to start the slave trade. Then the Africans rebuilt the Congo after throwing the Portuguese out, brought into being a fine king, Shamba Bolongongo, outlawed warfare, sent his men to Nidhi, a lot of the evidence of this kingdom, especially the figurines depicting the different royal family, can be found in the Brooklyn Museum. And one of the great kings that followed Shamba, Bomancelli, his likeness is also in the Brooklyn Museum. My main point is that Africans created before the Europeans societies that had no word for jail because no one had ever gone to one. No word for orphanage because no one had ever thrown away grandma or children or grandma. No word for old people's homes. I'm saying they had an indigenous religion that had a value transcending that of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, principally because they lived it out. They didn't do a lot of preaching. They lived it out. I read, I read a PhD thesis, University of Syracuse, by a Ghanaian dealing with an African religion, with Af why African religions never became world religions. And he explained that because first they were free, no commercialism, no pew, no silver piping. And actually, he didn't make any demands on any money. How can you become great when you're not asking for anything? You're not passing any collection plate? You're not penalizing people for not showing up? You greet them when they do show up. You know, asking, why were you last Sunday? Religion is not a Sunday thing anyway. Religion is an everyday thing. It's a part of your very being. It's not a Sunday or Saturday, you know, it's totality. And that 
all the elements that went into the making of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam came out of Africa. Africans are rather naive about their own creations in relationship to religions. And if they studied Western religions, they would discover that most of what you think of a Western religions were originally African religions, updated and rehashed anyway. It was theirs uh, in the first place. Because Africans are overly generous. They're always giving things a chance and trying things on for size and not knowing. Many times they try something on for size and that they've got something better at home. Yeah, democratic to a fault. More democratic toward foreigners sometimes than, than, than to, uh, to themselves. But I think in the world of tomorrow, in the building of new African governments, Africans will have to understand that they created concepts of living, of social living, not only before Karl Marx created socialism, but before Europe itself was born. And they have to believe again in their own values, in their own self, in, in themselves. When you want to oppress a people, the first thing you have to do is to destroy their self-confidence and historical memory. And Africa not only needs an economic rebuilding, but a spiritual and cultural rebuilding. A case of rebuilding their own confidence in their own religion. I remember the evenings I spent with Kwame Nkrumah's schoolmaster, Joseph E. Danqua, who tried to get across to him the possibility of drawing from a Ghanaian traditional state and that he could put the two together and build a modern state. And there was no contradiction between the traditional state and the modern state. And he could have, that the two could have made it workable. That uh, it was a dream, it still could, could have been realized in that the model of the European, while it might work for the European, it wouldn't work for the African because it lacked spirituality. Well, that's not our, our worry, but I think if we uh, go into tomorrow, Africans will have to take the totality of Africa into consideration. And now, I don't worship any Western religion, and yet I consider myself a very spiritual person. And yet, when I go to my hometown, Columbus, Georgia, and my sister takes me to Gethsemane Baptist Church, where I used to teach Sunday school, I respect that fact. I think the new minister is too young and can't preach. I think they've got a good choir. I respect that fact. I don't like to go to any church where they can't sing anyway. But I would not go into her church and tell my religion is the opiate of the people. I wouldn't be that stupid. Even if I believed it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into her church. I wouldn't say it, but it might be the opiate of some people, but not the opiate of all people. It's, it's, it's life and death for some people. So in, in our socialism, we're going to have to handle it different from some other people. We might have to socialize it, then clean it up. My main point.